10, 15 minutes, then wrap up here. It's only obtained a refinancing loan that was used to purchase the property or most home equity lines of credit. If you've got a HELOC or home equity line of credit, even if you use it to buy the property, many banks are taking a position of, we don't care if you use it to buy the property. It's a revolving debt, therefore we're going to consider it a recourse note. That's when you may need to hire an attorney because by definition, it was a purchase money note according to the attorneys that I talked to. And so if you can afford to fight it, you, you might want to consider that. The borrower is personally liable for a recourse note. The lender can look beyond the collateral and go after you personally. Debt forgiveness from a recourse note is treated as income for income tax purposes. If you've got a recourse note, it doesn't matter whether you short sell, foreclose, or modify. All bets are off. You've got deficiency problems and you have income tax issues. So is it better than to short sale and get more money for the property? You bet, because the more money you get for the bank at that point, the less deficiency balance you've got to fight. And the more money you get for the bank, the less income taxes you've got to be able to get rid of. So you want to get as much money for that property as possible in every case. I'm here to tell you that it is very, very rare when it's in your best interest to allow the home to go into foreclosure. Very, very rare. So what are the possible solutions? All past lead to 1099-C or A. Remember, it's all reportable income. You're going to use IRS Form 982. This is one of those things where you can, when you're interviewing, you say, hey, what is IRS Form 982? If they don't know, that could be a concern. If you say, hey, do all past lead to cancellation of debt income if I don't pay the lender back in full? I don't know. Maybe you might want to consider somebody different. So use these little bullet points here to help you choose the right type of CPA. The goal is to find ways to exclude the income reported from the debt forgiveness event. That's the whole goal here. Here's the three ways you can do it. Mortgage Debt Relief Act, bankruptcy, or insolvency. Insolvency doesn't mean you have to file bankruptcy. The Mortgage Debt Relief Act is a great act. It was extended by the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. So just know this, you have protection on your original primary loan for your purchase money loan for your primary residence for tax years 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. <coughs> but if you refinanced or pulled cash out, it's a second home or investment property, you don't have any protection. With the exception of bankruptcy or insolvency, or when I teach with the IRS, Jerry from the IRS, when we train, when we talk together, he'll say, well, we also accept payments. And he actually says it with a straight face. <laughs> so the Debt Forgiveness Relief Act, obviously, we covered that. It covers nationwide, it covers up to $2 million of indebtedness income. It doesn't apply for refinance when there's been a cash out or second home or investment properties. And here's an example of somebody who could go either way. Let's talk about a foreclosure versus a short sale. If this person has a $500,000 home they bought in 05, and they had a negative advertising loan, so they owe 520, the fair market value of the property was only 250 in 2009. Doubt right. They lost their home to a foreclosure, let's say, in 2009. They would have mortgage debt relief income of $270,000 that they would have to report to the IRS as well as the Franchise Tax Board. Regardless whether they pay taxes, they have to report that income. Then they use IRS Form 982 to explain to the IRS, tax me or don't tax me. Here's why. It's a worksheet. If it was with their original purchase money loan, they had the anti-deficiency protection in California, right class? You learned that tonight. And because of that, they're protected under the Mortgage Debt Relief Act in an involuntary act. So they're also protected for income tax purposes. But if they short sold that property, that $270,000 is taxable income. But if they can claim insolvency to offset that or offset the majority of it, they may say, hey, it's better for me to go ahead and make a little bit of payment and buy years earlier. Remember I showed you that slide that said, hey, you may end up paying $20,000, $25,000 but if you don't pay that and the rates go up a couple of percent, which they will, which they will or more, or a lot more, it's going to cost you an extra $112,000 in interest, right? So you need to be thinking about this long term, not just the short term. Here's somebody who's in bad shape and only insolvency or bankruptcy is going to take care of them. Here is Mr. Smith. He bought a home with his 
wife uh, um, in 2001 for 200,000. The appraised value in 06 was 500,000. He put some money down and made some payments, so we owed one, two, uh, 150. He pulled out $250,000 and refinanced his home for $400,000. He used it to pay off his car, help his daughter from college, paid off his Visa and MasterCard. He lost his job and they had a hardship and they lost their home to foreclosure or short sale, doesn't matter, for $275,000 in 2009. They have debt relief income of $125,000 and also possible capital gains because they bought the home for $200,000 and it sold in a short sale for $275,000, leaving $75,000 with capital gains. You follow me? You see why you need to run, not walk to your CPA? And your <coughs> agent, your help certified C20 master's agent, oftentimes they have great referrals for you that uh, you can benefit. And I, and I also have people that I can direct you to. California now conforms to federal law. If you know somebody that paid taxes to the, to the Franchise Tax Board in 2009, and you believe that they shouldn't have, let me know. I can guide you to the right person at the Franchise Tax Board. You can file an amended return if that's somebody you know if they have protection, because California wasn't protecting people in 2009, but then they passed a law, SB 401, and it went retroactive. So some people can now file an amended return to get a refund. Bankruptcy, under Title 11 U.S. Bankruptcy Code, and under 108 of the Revenue Code, it describes how bankruptcy can get rid of that cancellation of indebtedness income liability. So you may want to get a free consultation with a bankruptcy attorney if this may cause you concern. Here is the last couple of slides that I need to share with you before I wrap up and I got a short little three minute video I just want to close with. Under Internal Revenue Code, and here's if you really want to scare your, your CPA and have them go, wow, you are wickedly smart. It's Internal Revenue Code, Section 108A1B. It's up there on the screen. This is where the Internal Revenue Code discusses insolvency. And if you can cite the code, chapter and verse, um, obviously that person is going to want to make sure that they take very good care of you because you know your business. You have to determine, well, let me just read a couple of points here. Taxpayers who do not declare bankruptcy but are technically insolvent are not subject to the taxes. It's the bottom line. So here's what I want you to do. If you were to take a sheet of paper at home, this is just an exercise you will get your CPA or your agent to help you. And you draw a line down the middle of the page. You put a plus on one side and a minus on the other. On the plus side, you're going to write down all of your assets. Because you're determining your assets, the fair market value of your assets, before the discharge of debt, what is your largest asset? Your house. Conversely, on this side of the page, all your liabilities, what's your largest liability? house. You owe four and it's worth two. Just based on those numbers alone, how many hundreds of thousands are you insolvent? Two hundred thousand. Now keep in mind, when we were down there in San Antonio talking to the IRS and HUD, I said, um, what else is counted? And without bat an eye, there was a little uh, uh, gal there who said, well, if I'm doing an audit, you know, we count the socks and the underwear and the spoons, the forks and ice. And I thought she was joking, so I started laughing. She didn't laugh. Um, she was dead serious. No, they count everything. And so you want to not do this without having somebody help you. Because you know what? You can tell the IRS anything you want, can't you? Until when? Audit. In audit. Then you better be able to back up what you say. So the time to back up what you say is when it's happening, not a year or two or three down the road when you get audited. And guys, is there a greater chance of getting audited than ever before? Does the government need more money? Yes. Absolutely. And what did the health care bill authorize Treasury to do? In order to monitor your tax returns and make sure you're paying your health insurance payments, it authorizes them to hire between 10 and 15,000 additional auditors. And if they're looking for your health insurance payment, you don't think they might also be looking for this too? So please make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's on this subject matter. Um, determination, as I said, has to be done for the discharge of debt, run down to your CPA, get a referral, make sure that you can solve this issue. And again, the taxpayer uses IRS form 